I'm going to start this video by showing you that the raw Fourier coefficient, so the output of the FFT function, has units that are basically uninterpretable. And that will lead to a discussion of two scaling factors, two normalization factors that you can apply to the Fourier coefficients in order to interpret uh, or put the Fourier coefficients back into the units of the original data. So here is a few lines of MATLAB code. Essentially, I'm just taking the sign of some numbers. It doesn't even matter. It's 0 to 12 pi. But you can see that the amplitude of this sine wave is 1, right? I'm not multiplying by any uh, amplitude parameter, which means that by default, it's set to 1. Then I take the FFT, and the output of the FFT function is the series of Fourier coefficients which I then use as input into the ABS function. And that function will extract the magnitude, which is the distance from the origin of each Fourier coefficient. And that tells us the amplitude. And then I'm just making a bar plot of it. And then here I'm just setting the y-axis limit. OK, so here you see what that bar looks like. Now we know for sure we simulated this signal. We made up these data. The amplitude has to be 1. Why is the amplitude? you know, whatever this value is, it's a little bit less than 150. Or maybe it's exactly 150. But it's clearly not one. So what is going on here? Why does this value here not match the original signal that I created? I know what the ground truth is. There are two reasons for this. One is one has to do with the the loop implement or you can see it in the loop implementation of the Fourier transform. So what we're doing here is computing the dot product between the complex sine wave at some frequency and the signal. And this is so the element wise multiplication and then sum. And now if you remember, a few videos ago, I talked about the zero hertz frequency and what that means. So when we have the zero hertz frequency, the sine wave is just a vector of all ones. And then essentially, we're just summing up all of the signal elements. So you can see that as the signal gets longer and longer and longer, the Fourier coefficient for the zero hertz frequency is going to get larger and larger and larger, of course, because we are just summing together more and more numbers. So if we want to get the average value of the signal, we have to divide. And what do we have to divide by? Well, obviously, we divide by the number of data points in the signal. That gives us the average. So. The same concept applies for every frequency. I think it's just easiest to, to understand, to internalize, when thinking about the zero hertz frequency. So this is one of the two normalization factors for, a, uh, for the Fourier coefficients. You're computing a lot of sums here, so then we want to divide by n. And that is like an average. That's basically taking the average of the relationship between the complex sine wave and the signal. And now let's go back here and look at this. So the number of points in this time series here is 300. So if we were to divide this by 300, so if we would say, you know, out here, divide by 300, that would bring this from 150 down to 0.5. It would bring us down to one half. And now that is still not exactly the right answer. The right answer should be one because that's what we simulated here. So why do we get an answer of one half when we should be getting one? Well, I hope that you can already see where this is going. I hope you can already guess what is going to be the second of two normalization factors for the Fourier coefficient. And that is to multiply by 2 because the amplitude gets split between the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies. So we can double the positive frequencies and then ignore the negative frequencies. Now, just to be clear, the doubling is valid because for a real valued input signal, the negative frequencies mirror the positive frequencies. If you are working with complex valued signals, then you don't actually double the positive frequencies, what you're really technically doing is folding this whole thing. You know, imagine uh, creasing this page over here along the Nyquist frequency and then folding all of these negative frequencies so they sum on top of the positive frequencies. That's really what you have to do. You have to add the negative frequencies 
onto the positive frequencies. But for a real valued signal, these two are mirrors, so in practice, it's a lot easier just to ignore the negative frequencies and double the positive frequencies. Okay, so there you go. So to recover the accurate units from the Fourier transform, for example, it might be microvolts, if that's what your signal was originally recorded in, you have to divide the Fourier coefficients by n, and then you have to sum together all of the negative and corresponding positive frequency coefficients and in practice that really just means that you ignore the negative frequencies and double the positive frequency coefficients. Now let me make two important notes here. One important note is that zero, also the Nyquist, but we are particularly concerned with the zero hertz frequency, is not doubled. It's not doubled because zero has no corresponding negative frequency. You can also see that here from thinking about this sine wave being a vector of all ones when the frequency is zero. So we get all ones here and then we add up, we sum up all of these signal elements, divide by n, and that already gives us the average. If you divide that average by two, that's no longer the average, that's going to be half of the average. So the zero hertz component does not get doubled. Only the positive frequencies excluding zero get doubled. Technically, that holds for Nyquist as well. But in practice, we, you know, people can um, often in, in practical data analysis, people will interpret the zero hertz component, but uh, people basically never go up to uh, interpreting the Nyquist frequency in practical data analysis. There is a second point that I want to note here, which is equally important. And that is that these two scaling factors are linear multiplicative factors. They change the y-axis values, but they do not change the shape of the spectrum. So the spectrum is not going to look any different if you, have, if you apply or don't apply these two normalization factors. And therefore, scaling is not always necessary. Scaling, the, so applying these two normalization factors is necessary only if you want the results of the Fourier transform to have the same units as the original signal. Now, it might seem strange that I'm saying that this is optional, but in real practical data analysis, you often don't care about the actual units. What you care about, in many cases, is the shape of the spectrum and the relative energy that is concentrated at different frequencies. So the shape of the power spectrum is never going to change with these two normalization factors. Therefore, when you see in code or in practice, in, in graphs, in visualizations, that the y-axis of an amplitude spectrum or a power spectrum is not in the same units as the original input data, then you know, don't freak out, it's most likely fine. There's relatively few exceptions where it is really important to have the output of the Fourier transform in the same units as the original data.